Hey guys, good evening to you. Praise the Lord. Praise our Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth. We're very specific around here. Because there's only one Lord, one Master, one Jesus. One chosen one of the Father. The Father, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he's Jesus of Nazareth, guys. Not Jesus. Not crossed. Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Okay? We need to get the right one, especially right here, as we continue forward. God's about to come get us. Jesus is about to come get his own. Okay? You hang in there. You stay faithful. This is a time of testing. Okay? You pass the test. Pass that test. Uh, we need to pray for Vondo. Poor guy, man. He fell off a ladder 10 feet high today. Fell on his back. And he's incredibly sore. The guy's big guy. 6'4", you know. Husky dude. And so, he's real sore. Please pray for him. Uh, big importance in the ministry. So, you know, everybody, all of you, all of you are so important to the ministry, uh, to the body of Christ Jesus. Do your job. Stay faithful. Stay in your lane. Know your calling. Make your calling and your election sure. And uh, please the Lord in all this. Okay? Just please the Lord. And uh, he's easy to please. He's easy to please. Just... Just abide with him, abide in him, love his word, know his word, hide it, share it with others. Uh, Putin today is telling the world, he's like, guys, I'm not crazy. I I'm, not, I'm not a psycho madman, okay? And uh, our doctrine concerning warfare, nuclear warfare, is we're going to strike first. Because if you don't strike first, you won't be striking second either. And he says, We're, we can come after Europe and we can come after the United States of America. And he was mentioning these things as a threat. Hey, did you hear that the banks are missing $65 trillion and they have until January 1st to find it? I don't know what happens if they don't find it because they're not going to find it. But I do know this. The day before the World Trade Centers went down, they made the announcement that they were missing $2.3 trillion. Guys, we're missing $2.3 trillion, and the next day, boom! They even hit the Pentagon, guys, where the records and files were kept. The Pentagon, okay, along with the Trade Towers. They got rid of all the evidence. Oh, dang. And that got it out of everybody's minds. Who cares about that $2.3 trillion? What about those buildings that just fell that those terrorists took out? Those terrorists were your presidents, your senators, your congressmen. They're the terrorists. And because of that incident, Jay Sekulow, remember him? He helped write the Patriot Act. And they had the terrorist this and the terrorist that and the terrorist. And the whole time he was scribing that, he was concerning his own people, the Christians, that we would soon one day be the terrorists. You know that guy that drove by and just shot out the uh, Transformers and everything in North Carolina? They're deeming him a terrorist. And so the group he probably belongs to uh, it has Christian flags, Bibles, guns, four-by-four four trucks. Oh, that's a terrorist. There you go. And all that verbiage in that Patriot Act was evil. We, we were shouting it from the beginning that it was evil, evil, have nothing to do with this, folks. And here it is on the doorstep. But you hang in there. Jesus Christ is coming to get his own. You ready for that? You ready to be raptured? You ready to be called out of here? Pray for one another, love one another, take care of each other. Yeah, the Bible code's unsealed. Thank you, Lindy. We got to put that on there. A couple of you have said you're going to be praying for Vondo. Good. And uh, why don't we look at 1 Peter tonight? Uh, man, I like it all. I like it all. Let's just look at chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. Do you want to be pleasing the Lord? You know, the last couple of nights we've been talking about walking holy before the Lord. There is a difference in walking holy and unholy. 
There's a difference in being separated unto the things of God and not being separated unto the things of God. There is being a disciple and not being a disciple of God. And God said this, Jesus said this, and you got to picture it, guys. You got to picture it in Satan's world. I mean, Satan's a mimicker, okay? Let's say you wanted to be a disciple for some great Buddhist monk at a uh, monastery or Tibet. You climb high these Tibetan walls, you get there, and they only let you in with the clothes you're wearing so you can come in and change into the clothes they are wearing. And that's all you have in the world. You don't come with anything else to be trained and disciplined as a disciple of this monk. They got that from God. God requires that of all of us. You're not going to be my disciple unless you dump everything in the world and you come naked. You come by yourself alone and nothing else. Nothing attached. No money, no houses, no lands, nothing of this material world. That's all forgotten in your mind. You don't care nothing about that. That holds zero value to you. Family, that means nothing if they oppose Jesus. Lord, if they oppose you, they're nothing to me. Though I love them, I love them with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. I love my wife. I love my kids. I love my aunts and uncles and cousins. I love my parents. But if they oppose you, I'm going with you. And it will seem like I hate them. Oh, he's always contradicting us. He's always opposing us. He's always going against us. No, that's not true. I'm always going for Jesus, guys. And it appears that I'm going against you because you're going against Jesus. I love Jesus with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, and you mean nothing to me compared to my love and my heart for my Lord Jesus, who I love with my heart, soul, mind, and strength, all of it. And that's what he said. And you haven't even begun to be a disciple of Jesus Christ unless you have dumped everything, forsaken all, and follow me. Denying yourself, all of you, picking up your cross, and follow me. If a man doesn't do that, he cannot. He cannot be my disciple, Jesus said. There are so many Christians in the body of Christ today who are not disciples of Christ. They go to church every week. They're faithful. They sing in the choir. They're on bus routes bringing in the little kids bringing in the sheaves, and they're not even disciples of Christ Jesus. I don't know any pastors in the pulpit personally. I, I know some online, but I don't know any pastors personally who are disciples of Christ Jesus. They got too much of the world in them. They, they love everything about this world. They love everything about materialism. They love their house. They love their vacations. They tell us all about it. And Jesus gets low, low, low billing. That's not a disciple because there's no other billing than Jesus when you're a disciple. It's all Jesus. That's what he said. Read all those red letters in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And when you come across this disciple thing, really study it out. And guys, my heart for you, the reason we preach this is so that you will be a disciple. That you'll come to the end of the line of yourself You'll come to the end of the line of everything on this planet. And you will come to the place where you hate the things you used to love. You'll hate entertainment because you recognize the author of that entertainment. God's not the author of confusion. Homosexuality is confusion. Lying, conniving, manipulating, jealousies, envy, hatred, strifes, those are all confusing no unity, no harmony there. Those all oppose God. And that was just in today's episode of General Hospital. Okay? Remember your mama, grandmama watching that 30 years ago? Same garbage. Granny and mommy were deceived, and maybe so are you. I hope you're not. I hope you are coming to the place where you have burned all your idols. You don't pray to saints. You know, that's wicked. All saints, who even let's just say all the saints are called saints. But you must know at one time they were all sinners that needed Jesus Christ. Okay? Don't pray to a sinner who needs Jesus Christ. You pray to one Father, and the way we come to that Father, there's no other way except through Jesus Christ. He is the way. He's the truth. And He is the life. No man comes to the Father except through Him. 
all about Jesus, zero about this world. That man last night said, oh man, I, gotta, I bought some cows, man, I need to go look at them. The other guy, I bought some land, dude, I, I gotta go look at it. Oh, I just married a wife, Lord, and, and my time with her keeps me from you, okay? And the master of the house, the father, was so enraged, he told his servant, he says, you go out there, I have prepared a meal. There is a marriage supper here, and I'm going to have people eat that thing, and I don't care who they are. You go invite everybody. You compel them to come in, and let's fill this house up. And the boy came back, and he said, well, I, I've told a lot of folks, but we still got plenty of room. He said, you get out there and compel them to come in. You tell them the story about this place. They'll want to be here, and I don't care if they're blind, maimed, halt, withered up. And he went through this whole list of rejects. Aren't you thankful to be on that list? Aren't you thankful that God included you on that list to come on into my house and wear my robe? We wear the robe of righteousness. That, that's what lets us into the house. Aren't you thankful for that? And that's through Jesus Christ. And by the time we, from tonight until we are raptured, five months or less, you walk with Jesus and you delete everything else. Jesus alone Christ Jesus alone, nothing else. Jesus will be very pleased, and you will have been one of the few, a true disciple of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. That's what he's looking for, very few. Can somebody name me, that, that you could say, I, my pastor, my pastor, where I attend church with a physical group, a physical body, my pastor is sold out and it's only about Jesus. He hates everything in this world. He hates the movies. He hates entertainment. He hates sports. Guys, please come to realize about sports. Sports is a demonic activity. Most of those boys, while they were in college, they knelt at an altar of their frat, their fraternity or chicks, their sorority, and they paid homage to a different God other than Jesus, which means they don't have Jesus in their life. I don't care if they spout out, I love Jesus, and go Jesus, and even do it in sign language while they're on the field. They have knelt to another God, and God says, you'll have no other God before me, so you must be considering a different Jesus than me. If you're praising a Jesus, and you knelt at an altar at your fraternity, and then they go get brands, and then they go get tattoos of that frat on them. And then they talk about that frat. And then when you go, you find out what frat they went to, and you read their oath. Find that online. Wikipedia is your friend. It's, they're the devil. Wikipedia is the devil, and they'll reveal all their stuff to you. Okay? And you read their oaths. One little girl was on there. Oh, y'all. I got some sort of this and that. I think it was some sort of cancer. I need y'all to pray for me. Lift me up to the Lord. And then you go over to her page, and it's all about her sorority sisters and how proud she is of them, and blah, 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 and nothing Jesus, nothing glorifying him while things were good. That's not a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's almost an enemy of God. I'm going to say you are an enemy of God. You pray, Guys, when, when you go on there and you look at these oaths, then you go read about them who their patron god or goddess is. They all have one of those. That's what keeps them from being Christian, from being saved. They're not even wearing the robe of righteousness. They are deceived, thinking they're wearing a robe of righteousness because they have bowed down to other gods other than the Lord Jesus Christ alone. The only way to be saved is forsaking all the other devils that, that are in your life, receiving, believing the story that God is God. And who is God? He's God alone. Okay? The person telling you how to be saved needs to tell you that it's Jesus Christ who left heaven, and he has the same characteristics as Jehovah of the Old Testament. He's God. He's the only wise God. Beside him, there is no other God. And this one God only came down here to die for us. And you must place your faith in him and him alone. His death, his burial, his resurrection. Do you believe that? And someone will say yes or no. They must understand who they're believing in. And you and I must be responsible as disciples of the Lord. I'm trusting your disciples, guys. 
I'm trusting you've given everything you got to the Lord. It all belongs to Him. And if you were to lose everything materially tonight, it wouldn't bug you in one bit. You just trust the Lord. I've, I've trusted Him this far. I'm going to keep on trusting Him, and it's, it's His anyway. You know, the Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Job, remember him saying that? Job was one of God's top three when he's talking about faith in the scriptures. Okay? And Job said, it's all the Lord's, man. And that's what we got to say. And so these football players, these baseball players, these basketball players, hockey players, volleyball, you just name the list, softball, baseball, they're all demon-possessed kids. And if not every single one of them is, most of them are. And that's all you need to win and lose games. Don't you think that Satan is the prince of the power of the air? Don't you think he can control the spin of a football? Angle of a football? From the possessor of that devil? Let's just say Tom Brady right now. Tom Brady's married to a witch. You guys know that? And he says so. My wife's a witch. Well, that makes him distant from the Lord. He's, he's not of God, of Abraham, Isaac. Now, we already know this based on his testimony and everything he said through the years. Okay, This guy's not about Jesus Christ. So he's lost. He's the goat. Okay, The greatest of all time. The goat. That's not good. And so now he has his big comeback the other night against the saints. What? Yeah, the Saints lost at the last moment because of this guy. It's all scripted. Guys, here's what you need to do. There's a guy, uh, Gematria Sports. Gematria Sports Effect. This guy is not a Christian. Matter of fact, he hates Christians. And he has figured out the numbers for the Illuminati and the Jesuits and the Freemasons. And he, knew, he knows who's going to win the game. Next time they play, every game, all he does is look at statistics, looks at names, looks at numbers, looks who the officials are, and his mind is that fast and that quick. He looks at the numbers involved, and he says, okay, we're going to put $1,000 on this team to win. And they win. It's because they figured it out because it's scripted. Now, Christians don't know that it's scripted. They get out there and hoopty and holler and cheer for their favorite team. Oh, boy. And they take three hours to do it in a football game. And, ah, 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 they're taken away by every satanic, devil, demonic movement. Every hit, every catch, every pass, every tackle, every run, every opening in the field. It's all by design. And all the devils are in on it. Both teams they have a final result that they need, and they're going to make it done. And these guys who sign the line are in on it, too. Not everybody. Now, there's some naive boys on the team who they'll bring in, these young Christian kids who's a good athlete, and they'll need him or, or her right there for special moments. They need their name involved because their name is highly charged, highly numerical and highly charged. Okay? And so they'll use them, and they're not on the inside, but they're being pawns. And they're in the middle of a devil game. And you're going to get to heaven and know all this, that you worshiped devils every time you watched games, football games, hockey games, baseball, prince of the power of the air, the pitch and the bat, and how far the ball will sail, where it hit on the bat. I'm telling you, you have got to understand this. And Satan has used this to beguile Christians. And who are Christians supposed to be? Let's read 1 Peter chapter 2. Wherefore, it is time for us to lay aside, it, it's up to us, we got to put away sin. Your sin, okay? We've been talking about the preacher's sin and other people's sin. Now we, every day, every moment of every day, we, we're looking in the mirror and say, okay, Lord, create in me a clean heart, renew a right spirit within me, and you let me know if there's any wicked ways in me. Let's get rid of that. I hate wicked ways. I hate what you hate, Lord, and I don't want there to be any in me. I don't want to be controlled by any devil or any past sin. So we lay aside everything, and he tells us right here, lay aside malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speaking. God always has these lists throughout the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament. Remember that list of Sodom last night that we read? And the number one thing on that list is pride. The second one is taking pictures of your food. 
You're too well-fed and fat and sassy. You haven't been without a meal in a long time and it shows. That's just number two on the list. There's always list. God has lists and you make sure you're n never, never, never on the sinful list. And if you find yourself there, say, Lord, I, I, I'm, I want this gone in my life. I want this gone. I want the opposite. I want your spirit lead me. Holy Spirit, please just pull off the opposite of this. Opposite of malice. Opposite of hypocrisy. Okay. Let's make, make everything not of the devil and only of Jesus. So lay aside all malice, guile, hypocrisies, envies, and all evil speaking. Anything that does not bring absolute glory to the Lord. Get out of the habit. Quit talking that junk. That's your TV. Everything that comes through your TV, think about it. Everything that comes through your TV has to do with somebody's malice, somebody's guile, somebody's hypocrisy, somebody's envying, and much evil speaking. What is evil speaking? Evil speaking is anything that brings down the kingdom of God, as far as down, not bringing it down from heaven, bringing it down, raising it, destroying it. Okay? Isn't it funny that when you raise a building, you have destroyed that building? All day long, even in your cartoons, when they are glorifying the new age, and guys, if you were so discerning, you could understand that all the cartoons are glorifying the new age, and they're teaching your children new age doctrine, which is goodness and greatness and peace and uh, a wonderful life ahead and beauty and bounty and unicorns. Stay away from all that talk, okay? And get Bible talk rolling off your lips because it's in your heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, your mouth will speak. Do you know if you filled your heart with righteous things, you won't have to worry about evil speaking? You'd have righteous speaking. The problem is there's not too many listeners, are there? That's why we get together with each other and, and of like-minded and find groups online and you know, communicate good stuff and always talking about Jesus, his return, the gospel. Verse 2. Now, this is the key. This is the key. As newborn babies, you are supposed to be desiring, thirsting. Do newborn babies want to eat? Do they want to wake you up in the middle of the night to eat? God says, I, I want you to be like that. I want you to be like a newborn baby desiring the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. God's very intent on all of his children growing. He's intent on all sinners becoming saints because he's not willing that any should perish, but that all could come to repentance. The Bible definition of a saint is one who's saved, one who's born again. One who has placed their absolute faith and belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ. That person is a saint, not what the Pope and the Greek Orthodox and the rest of them teach. Okay? They're liars. Let God be true. Study what a saint is in Scripture. Okay? You'll never see Paul being called Saint Paul. You'll never see Peter being called Saint Peter. Never. Search the Scriptures. Verse 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2, as newborn babies, man, it's important that you desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby, verse 3. If so be that you have tasted that the Lord's gracious. If so be that you've tasted that the Lord's gracious. Have you tasted that? Have you come to understand that God is great? You can't be saved without graciousness. It's grace. It's a free gift. It's gifting, gifting, gifting. Not of works. Verse 4, to whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Remember the cornerstone? He was the rejected stone. And we over here said, no, I'll build my life on you. I, I won't reject you as the cornerstone. You, you, be the, you be the key focal stone of my building. You be the foundation. There's no other foundation than the one that can be laid, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I want you, and I want to grow on you, and I'm going to build my house on you. But chosen of God and very precious to God. Very precious to those of us that believe and have the heart and mind of God in us. Verse 5. Ye also as lively stones are built up in a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifice acceptable by God and Jesus Christ. 
Everybody's making sacrifices. Everybody's offering up some sort of smell. Right now, this time of year, it's fake incense smells of Christmas. You know, all that cinnamon and peppermint and, you know, whatever else they throw in there. Okay? God wants you, your life, to be an obedient one. He's calling us. He wants every sinner to be saved, and he wants every saint to be a disciple. Now, going from sinner to saint is easy. It's coming to the Lord and believing. I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. I'm in quicksand, and I need someone to save me. And the only one who can do it is Jesus Christ. Death, burial, and resurrection. Pull me out of the quicksand of hell. Pull me out of the quicksand of selfishness. The quicksand of everything that's going to tear me apart and destroy me in the end for eternity. I need help, and Jesus is my only help. We believe in his death, burial, and resurrection to pull us out of that quicksand and set our feet on a rock the solid rock of Jesus Christ, the rejected stone who now becomes the head of our corner. And we build our lives on him. That's discipleship. But not every Christian's done that. They've been saved. He set us up on a rock and then all we got's a rock. And what they build on that rock, the foundation, is everything of this world. Going to college. I'm going to go to college, get my degree, get my master's degree, and then maybe work on that doctorate so I can get the position. Now, so sometimes God calls us to that, okay? But most of the time, he doesn't. Most of the time, it's our goals, our bucket list, our desires, okay? And the purpose is money, not getting the gospel into the middle of these people. When I have this doctorate, whether it's in chemistry or whether it's in education, my purpose needs to be I'm doing all this so I can be a minister to all the students that I'm immersed in the middle of every day. My purpose is Jesus. My walk is Jesus. My talk is Jesus because my heart is Jesus. And out of the abundance of the heart, boom, my life will glow and blow up. All things Jesus. And that's what he wants. Guys, are, are you a disciple? Last couple days, we've talked about that. Are you truly a disciple in the eyes of God? Are you a sweet aroma in the nostrils of the Holy One? Because you adore his only begotten son, Jesus. It's all about grace. And you, in your humble, humble heart, have said, you know, this world has never done a thing for me. I don't want nothing of it, Lord. I want it burned to the ground, and all I want is the heavenlies. I want heaven on earth. As it is in heaven, let it be here on earth in my heart, Lord Jesus. I want to walk with you, please you. I want you to be my God, you to be my king forever and a day. Let's look at verse 5. This is 1 Peter 2, 5. And also as lively stones are ye built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in the scriptures, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect and precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you therefore which believe he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the cornerstone. And a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto they were also appointed. Guys, if you've ever been a Christian disobedient to the Lord, that's worse than being lost. Out of touch, worldly Christians are the worst individuals on planet Earth. The meanest people at my work, and you could take a survey and say, who is the biggest, and you can use secular words, who is the biggest hateful blah, blah, blah in, in these places? And I know three of them will be Christians right now at my work. It's the truth because they are worldly. They are godless, and they are recognized by Satan's people to be terrible individuals. There's nothing worse than a worldly Christian. And we need to keep our lives and our foundation built on the rock. And we need to choose all our materials of things eternal. Gold, silver, precious stone. Costly stuff that comes from God for God for eternity's sake. Or earthly stuff, wood, hay, stubble. And it's all going to go through a fire. And it's going to be burned to the ground. And you want that which is gold, silver, and precious stone. Precious to continue on for eternity. That's because you were a disciple of Jesus Christ. That, that's the difference here. Those who follow the Lord Jesus continually, guys, your reward's going to be great when he raptures us. He's about to rapture us very soon.
okay? He has his appointed date, and it's a mind blower. The day he has chosen to rapture us is incredible. Keep reading. Verse 9, but you are a chosen generation. He's talking to Christians. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Not just a nation, you're a holy nation, a set-apart group of people who are considered by God to be a nation. Not one nation under God here in America, one nation under God Christianity, followers, disciples of Christ Jesus of Nazareth. That is the nation we belong to. That is the peculiar nation, the holy nation. We're a peculiar people. Okay? Let's read that again. But you, Christians, he's writing to brethren, are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness. You don't remain in darkness. Guys, this world is darkness. Egypt is darkness. Assyria is darkness. It's all darkness here, man. Babylon, darkness. The kingdom of light is the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of the one who is light, Jesus Christ. And he left us and he said, now you be that light. And he touched us with his Holy Spirit. The oil is burning in us and should be burning bright. And that means there's no darkness around you because the darkness cannot comprehend it, cannot extinguish light. Light extinguishes darkness. Okay? And you and I are supposed to be that light shining bright here in all this darkness. Egypt, Babylon, Assyria. Okay? He's called us out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past we were not a people, but now we are a people of God. We had not obtained mercy, but now we've obtained mercy from God. Oh, dearly beloved, I beg you as strangers and pilgrims, are you, are you 100% a stranger to this world? A pilgrim, you know that you're sojourning, you ain't got no plans. I got no plans for tomorrow, I'd rather be raptured tonight. Lord, come on, come get us. Is that your heart? It needs to be your heart, that's the Bible's heart, that's God's heart. That's the only begotten son's heart. That was Peter's heart, that was Paul's heart. They wrote some Bible for us, John, the apostle, that's his heart. That's everybody who's a true believer in the finished work of Jesus Christ and a true disciple. When you leave this world, you hate this world. You recognize light is far better than darkness. You recognize the wonderful smells of prayer and the heavenly incense as opposed to this stench. It smells like a sewer and an outhouse. Spiritually speaking, just death all around you, corpses all around you, Filth, trash, garbage, nastiness. This world blows. God knows it. And so do his disciples. I pray you're one of his disciples. And you left Babylon a long time ago. And if you hadn't, leave it tonight. Follow Jesus with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Dearly beloved, verse 11. This is 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11. Dearly beloved, that's Christians. I beg you, as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against your soul. I was a Christian who was a fleshly Christian for a while. When I first got saved, I wasn't. When I first got saved, I was in the independent Baptist church, and this particular group taught us to live holy. They taught us, once you're saved, you're saved by grace through faith. It, you'll never lose your salvation. It's a gift of God, blah, blah, blah. Now we go on and we grow in sanctification. And I was taught in that. Well, I was trained in that, and, and I was that. And I went to a Bible college that was that, okay? And then I left that Bible college and went to a Southern Baptist church. And Southern Baptist church, their guard's down. They have no guard. They have Jesus Christ the Savior. Ask him into your heart, Billy Graham. And then there's nothing there after that. They, they'll talk about, you know, living holy and stuff, but they don't. Uh, after church, we're all going to go to the Rated R movie, y'all. We're all going to go to the buffet and pig out together and we'll never bring Jesus up again. Next Sunday morning, we're all going to meet right here in the foyer just before church starts and we're going to talk about how the game went. And some of us will be in bad attitudes, bad moods because our God failed us. This is today's church. That was the Southern Baptist Church. Then at Christmas time, we're going to have the hanging of the green service. I went to a church Sunset Park Baptist Church, I started out as the part-time youth pastor 
dude there. The youth group grew. The church started having more attendees, and they pulled me on full time. We had our own Freemason decorating of the green service on a Sunday night, every Sunday night of Advent season. And then first week of Advent, we'd do blah, blah, blah. And second week of Advent, we'd do blah, blah, blah. Third week, all in December, way past Jesus' birthday. Hmm, then I learned of that. And I was a worldly Christian. Man, I just love these Southern Baptists. These Southern Baptists had it going, baby. Woo! I think God got a hold of me about 12 years ago. I said, boy. And he called us back to the old ways. He called us back to the old paths, the Bible says in Isaiah. Come back to the old paths. Come back to holiness. Come back to the way it's supposed to be. And he began to teach me, when you do that, when you have a desire, say, Lord, I don't want anything of this world. Will you teach me stuff? And he will blow your mind with what's coming next. Follow him. Follow him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Dump this world. Flush it. Abstain from fleshly lust because you'll always be at constant war. And I was. I was. I love the Lord. I'd be talking to him, but I'd be in the miserable of a fleshly event, a, a UFC we would all be at the UFC events, and boy, we're watching, throwing down, fighting, and hearing the commentators cursing, and F this and F that, and boom, 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 and oh, look at him go. And the whole focus was on earthly fighting warfare. And on the inside, I was experiencing spiritual warfare because I was in conflict because I had the flesh here, the world here, and Jesus here. And that is the most miserable place on the planet to be. And you finally flush this world, you, you flush the war of the flesh, and you give it over to the Lord Jesus Christ, man. And you walk with him in unity, peace, and harmony. And it has never been better. And I'm encouraging you, if you have found your way, you have drifted, you have been deceived. It's deception. It's, it's the snake coming in subtlety to the church. And just like he did in the garden. And that same snake that comes in subtlety will face you down here shortly as the dragon who doesn't come in subtlety, but he comes to kill, steal, and destroy. He'll woo you in and then choke you out, man. Fire, breathe that fire on you, and you'll be wishing you hadn't made those choices. And we're encouraging you to step out of that. You step in totally into the Lord Jesus Christ and read 1 Peter chapter 2 and ingest it, digest it, chew it up and cud until it is all the way through you and you're living this way. This is Peter talking to us. Verse 12, having your consciences, uh, what do you say? Having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold. They're going to glorify God in the day of visitation. They just loved what you did, but they hated what you did. They're going to call you evil. And they're going to call you vile because you don't do what they do, but they're going to know you were doing the right thing and they weren't. Verse 12, 13, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or governors. And then we're out of our conversation, what we were talking about. You're a holy nation. You're a peculiar people. You've been called out by God to be different, not to be the same. Are you? Are you a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ? How much world is in your house? Let's go to your house right now. We're going to walk in. And what are we going to see? What are we going to witness? Are, are we going to witness your totem pole there over in the corner all lit up, dressed up, propped up like a palm tree? Are we going to witness old Santa Claus and elves demons? Elves are demons. You can't get around an elf being a demon and Santa is the king of the elves. You can't get around that truth. That is a truth. So then we're going to walk into your house, man. We're going to walk into your computer. You're going to turn your computer on for us. We're going to go through your computer. Is that dedicated unto the Lord? Is that set apart? Is everything we're going to see, your, your history for the past month, is it going to be just bringing down righteousness and glory and men are going to see your good works and glorify the Father which is in heaven after looking at your computer and your history? God is so sick. Guys, turn to Deuteronomy 32. This is Moses getting ready to go into the promised land uh, or sending the children into the promised land. God's going to kill him. Because he smoked a rock, must we fetch you this water? We, the preachers, we, the ministers, we, the leaders, don't do nothing. It's God who does it all. 
We just obey him and say, okay, and then we see God work through us in obedience. We don't do anything. Uh, oh, your preaching is great. Yeah, well, the Lord said at, at the end time, he was going to take his word and put it in the mouth of faithful men. And so what we do is open up this Bible and read his word faithfully. And therefore, it's his word in our mouths. Do you hear it? Please heed. Deuteronomy 32, this is after the blessings and cursings. And then he's given a great warning. And remember, this is read aloud every seventh year at the Feast of Tabernacles. For the mothers and the children and all the men, everybody's to hear this read. And it ends with these last chapters. It goes to 34, but we're going to look at 32. I don't even know where to start, man. Uh, look at uh, verse 16. And they provoked God to jealousy with strange gods, and their abominations provoked they him to anger. Your strange gods are your Christmas trees. Your strange gods are your television. Your television is a god. You can't get around that. You can't get around that. If your television gets more playtime than God himself does, Bible reading, meditation, discipling others. Is that true? Oh, but we watch the religious channels. What? TBN? That's satanic as it gets. False doctrine, false gods, deceitfulness, deception of the snake, the serpent. The subtlety, come here. We said Jesus, right? Come here. Wrong Jesus, pal. Demons. Demons are being worshipped on TBN. Do not go there. God TV, devils are being worshipped there on God TV. Okay? We're telling you to get into your Bible and understand it, and you'll know what we're talking about. Okay? You, you ain't going to find a better sermon wind you up than T.D. Jakes, but that guy is a demon-possessed fool who doesn't even believe in the triune God. The Trinity. What are you going to do with that? The guy is a heretic, okay? Just because he can preach a fireball sermon doesn't mean he's in tune with the Lord. The Lord hates this man because this man defies God in defying the name Jesus Christ and presenting a different character than the one the Bible presents. Verse 16, this is Deuteronomy 32, 16. They provoked him to jealousy with strange gods. The list goes on in the Christian church, guys. There is so many... Your strange God, uh, you know, your remote. Your remote is a God. Your TV screen is a God. They've even made the electronics on your television to blow your mind. The waves coming off your TVs is here to transform your thinking and make you numb and to make you dull and to make you void of anything that is Christian and righteous. Along with the programming itself. I'm telling you, the programming is the teaching, the doctrine that gets to your heart, and also the uh, the physical uh, frequencies that are coming off your TV. They've been programmed. They, they were. You can go online right now and bring up the television um, patents, and it shows them how they want to program your mind and dull, you, dull your brain while they're putting in the information they want into you. They're programming you. That's not just a phrase. That is a real science that is really happening. Okay. Verse 17. They sacrificed unto devils. That is the church. Guys, tell me a pastor, your, your personal pastor. Tell me your personal pastor is a sold out disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. That he never glorifies sports. He never glorifies entertainment. He never glorifies the media. He never glorifies Trump. Is your pastor that guy? I've not met a disciple of Christ Jesus, a full, true, Bible uh, accounted, documented, what Jesus says a disciple is. I've never seen that guy as a pastor. And these guys are teaching a different Jesus. They're teaching a different discipleship. Wolves. Wolves. And they, they think they're great because they are deceived and they're deceiving others. Why are they deceived? Because they have not had a love for the love of the truth. I want to preach the truth, Lord Jesus, more than anything. Well, if they did that, 
they would cut their church in half by next Sunday. And if they kept doing that, they'd whittle it down to about a dozen. Okay? That's how it happens when you start proclaiming truth. Just look at all the prophets in the Bible. Look at Jesus. He looked at his 12 and said, are you guys going to quit me too? And Peter said, quit you. You have the words of life. We have nowhere else to go. We've invested all of our three years into you. Everybody else left Jesus when he said this. I'm God. Oh, whoa, hold the phone. That is just too holy for us, man. Oh, the phone. I'm going to go somewhere else where they're still talking about a Messiah coming. Not the Messiah is here and he's you. Oh, and they balked truth because they hate truth. And what they do is go ahead and sacrifice the devils instead. Verse 18. On the rock that beget thee, thou art unmindful. You never think about God. You don't think about God at all until you're in trouble. God to you is the God of bad times. When things are good, you don't need him. You're the God of you. You could control things. Things are awesome. You'll do your own planning. You'll do your own partying. You'll do your own investing. You'll do every... When things are bad, Lord God, you got to help me. Oh, God of, God of badness. Oh, please help me. Bible talked about you a lot. Of the rock that beget them, they are very unmindful and has forgotten God that formed thee. And when the Lord saw it, he abhorred them because of the provoking of his sons and of his daughters. And he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end will be for they are a very forward generation, children in whom there is no faith. You don't believe the preacher who's preaching the truth. You don't believe the Bible verses that we've read in the last couple days. If you do, I praise God for you. They're a very forward generation, children in whom is no faith. Verse 21, we're in Deuteronomy 32, 21. They have moved me to jealousy with that which is not God. You spend more time with what now than God? Do you spend more time with? What do you focus on? Is it your job? Are you a workaholic? Is your work your focus? Your work is everything that, that about you and achieve and accomplishing. And that's your God. And God says, you provoked me jealousy. You provoked me to jealousy with everything that ain't me. With their vanities. Your job's vanity. You guys know that the earth is about to flip in about five months or less, about to have a great earthquake in about five months or less. The whole world's going to flip and ain't nobody, nobody's job going to be what it was. The money, the U.S. money is gone. It's dead. They're looking for $65 trillion right now. Oh, sorry, we can't pay that back to you, China. Then what? You guys know that China has police stations in the United States of America governing their Chinese citizens? You know why they're able to do that? Because we owe them way too much money. They own us. And they can do whatever they want here. They just opened up two large stations in L.A. and New York City. Listen to this. You have provoked me to anger with all your vanities. And I, this is God talking. And I will move them to jealousy with whom, uh, with those who which are not a people, I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. What did we just read in 1 Peter chapter 2? We're supposed to be a holy nation. And our holy nation has turned into a foolish nation because we think our nation is the United States of America. Do you guys know that the United States of America, spelled in all caps, is a corporation and not a country? That's why this whole money thing's an issue with China. Because it's all being dealt with as a corporation, not a country. They own stock in us. They own us. Will you please recognize what I am telling you? Your name in all caps on your social security card makes you a citizen of the corporation. A slave of the corporation. Your little footprint on your birth certificate guarantees that you're going to pay back a quarter of the million dollars. Minimum. It's going up every day. 
And until you have paid your share, you are going to be a slave of China. Thank God for his intervention and that rapture. Amen. You guys looking forward to it? Because we're right here at the door. Jesus Christ wants to rapture a holy nation, not a foolish one. Verse 22, for a fire is kindled in mine anger and shall burn unto the lowest hell and shall consume the earth with her increase and set on, because God's about to decrease you. All these stupid prosperity preachers and those of you Christians who think you're going to do better and, and excel and get a bigger position later and, and your whole future is on you advancing. You've not read the Bible, have you? I'm encouraging you to listen to the preacher who's read the Bible and who's preaching it to you right here, asking you to open up to Deuteronomy 32, and there it is in black and white, holy writ that came from heaven, that was forever settled in heaven, ever written in heaven. And God got it down here knowing we'd be this people, a foolish nation, when he's called us to be a holy nation. I will, what does he say here? I'm going to take it down to the lowest hill, consume the earth with her increase, and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. This is about to happen because we have gone from a holy nation to a foolish one. Verse 23, I will heap mischief upon them. I will spend mine arrows upon them. Those are missiles. My mischiefs and my arrows. God is saying, I'm going to bring the sea over you, New York City. All my creation that you love and adore, you go to the beach every, every summer and you never think of me. All you think about is going down there to the beach and enjoying that beautiful sunset and all the creation. You never think of me. I'm going to drown you in that ocean. I'm going to poison you by that ocean. I'm going to send my arrows in, my missiles. Hey, Russia, come here. I got a job for you. They all belong to God. He's the almighty God. The almighty God is the God who has his hand in everything. Why don't you serve him with everything? Because you're a foolish nation and not a holy one. God's calling you back to holiness. Be a holy one. Be his disciple. Forsake this world. What, what's marriage? Forsaking all others. The Christian church hadn't forsaken all others. We want Jesus and the beach. Jesus and Gatlinburg. Jesus and the other stuff. Mm. holy matrimony a bride and a bridegroom you guys know you guys remember when the Lord laid it on Mackenzie Vondren's heart to start counting the Omer it was on the day of first fruits that's when we begin to count that was April 17th and we've been counting ever since keep on counting folks we're getting close close Close. Verse 24. And they shall be burnt with hunger. Does this sound like Revelation or what? We're reading Deuteronomy, guys. That's old book. That's, that's Old Testament. That's Moses. You guys know that Sean, I really believe he's related to Moses, guys. There's a lot of stuff pointing that way. That he's a son of Moses. He's called Moses over and over and over in the Bible code. And I don't think it's just oh, a, a name, a type of, a shadow. And here we got Moses talking the same stuff that John is talking in Revelation. That all the prophets talked about. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentation, Ezekiel going on and on and on concerning your foolish nation. And God's going to bring it on this foolish nation because we were called to be a holy one. And we said, nah, I don't want to read the Bible. I want to watch the movies. I want to watch sports. I need to unwind. I need to unwind. Grab me a beer and just sit down and watch this movie here. God didn't tell you to unwind. He told you to stay busy. He told you to earnestly fight, contend for the faith. He told you not to be weary in doing the right thing. Just keep doing the right thing. Now, I got to unwind. I got to bring in my other demons and worship them for a little while. You don't have or know the true Jesus Christ of Nazareth, if that's you. And we're calling you to be saved by the real God of heaven today. Have a real salvation. Somebody asked me, why in the world in the Bible did, did Jesus say, I speak to them in parables because I don't want to speak to them straight out because they'll probably, you know, 
believe and be converted and have their sins forgiven. It sounds like a great thing. Why wouldn't Jesus just tell it plainly? If he told it plainly, they would have become false converts. They would have had imagined what they thought he was saying in their own minds. When a fireman hears something being said, he thinks as it from a fireman's perspective. Oh, I see. And then when a mailman hears it, he thinks it from a mailman's perspective. And then a housewife, she'll think it from a housewife's perspective. And God wants you knowing it from his perspective. So God gives us parables. He gives us the Bible code, puzzles, riddles. And people who don't really care won't go any farther and they'll turn the channel and go turn their TV on. But those who have the heart of God and understand the mind of God, they'll ask a question. What else? What does this mean? Let's go farther in this. That's who God reveals more truth to from his perspective. Everybody else just heard the parable and then his disciples asked him afterwards, hey, what did that mean? Only his disciples will ask him what that means. Everybody else is not his disciple. You might be saved. You might believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ, the real Jesus of Nazareth. You may be born again. You may believe in his death, burial, and resurrection. But God's calling you to discipleship. Disciples want to know him. They are hungering and thirsting after Jesus. And their thirst cannot be quenched. I need more and more and more. Now, continuing on, we're almost done here. They'll be burnt with hunger. This is verse 24, Deuteronomy 32, 24. What happens when you, your holy nation stops holiness and they go on to do their own thing? They become foolish nation. And this is concerning the foolish nation. And that foolish nation is the entire world. There, there's only one nation who's a peculiar people and a holy nation. That's those who place their faith in Jesus Christ. We've been saved. We've been born again. One holy nation, the rest are foolish nations. And God's calling us to go to the foolish nations and compel them to come into the holy nation. Be saved. The only way to do that is come through the door. There's one door. His name's Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Will you come? Will you believe? And America believed and we've reverted back to a foolish nation. God's now going to send his arrows. He's going to send famine. All the same stuff that we see in the horses. Okay? All the 21 judgments. And he says, um, let's see here, 24. I will also send the teeth of beast upon you. We're going to be ripping you apart with Nephilim beast, guys. Demonic, demon-possessed beasts are going to be released on this earth. People love them in all the movies. Oh, I just love Spawn. Spawn is so awesome. You wait till he's biting your wife's face off in front of you. Okay? It won't be so cute and neat then. And God said in Deuteronomy 32 that that's what he's going to do to the foolish nation. All those who aren't raptured, God's only going to rapture the holy nation. We want you to be part of us. God wants you to be part of us, man. Let's continue on. I will send a beast and their teeth upon you with the poison of serpents of the dust. You're all dead. I'm killing everybody, whether it's missiles, fire, animals, snakes. I'm coming to kill you, God says, because you're a foolish nation. You said no to my wisdom. You said no to my holiness. And now you're going to suffer because fools suffer. Verse 25, the sword without terror within and... I'll destroy both the young man and the virgin, the suckling also with the man of gray hairs. I'm killing everybody, man. Praise God, the children will all be raptured. Don't you love that part? I said, I would scatter them to the corners. I would make the remembrance of them to cease from among America. You're forgotten. You think you're so great and we're the best country. I tell people, hey guys, uh, Russia is going to nuke us. They're going to bomb us. They're going to hit us with a tsunami bomb, and New York City will be totally under. You're crazy. We're the best. We got this. Th guys, do you guys know that everybody in the world and even the United States military knows that we don't have the best army and military anymore? That belongs to China, number one, and Russia, number two. We're number three. And then when they do away with us, well, then it's the European Union who they've already done away with because they've sent all their weapons to Ukraine and they have nothing to defend themselves with. 
It's been a great little game plan, war plan that Obama's come up with here. It's, he is behind it all. He is the Wizard of Oz. Behind the curtain, nobody sees him. God told us it's him. In over 100 Bible codes, this is your puppet master. He's the one planning all of this, the downfall, because he is the fool among fools. God calls him Nabal. Remember Nabal in the Bible? He promised David something and didn't pay up. He was a fool. And his wife Abigail was such a holy, godly woman. And she went to David. David was ready to kill this guy. And she said, please don't do that. Please don't do that. Because you're going to be king and we want to have a good remembrance of you. And you need to be blessed and not have this on your record. And David said, okay, you're right, you're right, you're right. And she went home. And when the man sobered up, Nabal, the fool, when he sobered up, she told him what had happened, and his heart smote him, and he was dead. He dies, and then David took her to be his wife. And he was so thankful that he hadn't acted on impulse, but used the wisdom of a woman, the wisdom of a wife, the wisdom who was married to a fool. And God calls Barack Obama Nabal, because he is the king of fools, the fool, the biggest one of the bunch, the fool of fools, man. And he says... Verse 27, were it not that I feared the wrath of the enemy, lest their adversaries should be should have themselves strangely, and lest they should say, hey, it was our high hand that did all this. God says, I'm keeping it all in wraps. It's going to be God who takes out America, not Russia. So God's going to make sure that Russia doesn't say, look what we did. Look what he's going to take them out. And whoever took Russia out, they, they're going to, look what we did. He'll take them out all the way until he gets to the Rothschilds, till he gets to the synagogue of Satan, the heart of the synagogue of Satan right there in Israel. And then he's going to take them all out, the final, the final bunch. And then there will be no evil left on the earth, and he'll set up the millennial kingdom. Ain't that going to be great? And it was all told us here in the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is Jesus' favorite book. He quotes from Deuteronomy more than any other book in the Bible. It's awesome. Keep reading. We're almost done here. 28. For they are a nation void of counsel, neither is there any understanding in them. We were once a holy, wise nation, and now we're a dumb, stupid, foolish nation devoid of counsel, and there's no hope for us. Verse 29. Oh, that they were wise. I wish they were wise, God said that they would understand what I'm talking about, that they would consider their latter days. Now, the holy nation didn't consider their latter days. The holy nation didn't consider God's weapons and his fire and his indignation and his beast coming to rip our faces off and the serpents coming to bite. We didn't consider any of that, what God told us in the beginning of the Bible. And we just went away from him and we, we served other gods that provoked him to jealousy, those that are not gods. And we called, we made them our gods. We placed them in priority ahead of Jehovah. Uh, turning a holy nation into a foolish one. And that's what's happened here, guys. For their rock is not as our rock, even our enemies themselves being judges. For their vine is the vine of Sodom. God calls us Sodom. God calls Israel Sodom. We're Gomorrah. And he's about to smoke us. And the fields of Gomorrah, th there we both are. Mystery Babylon is talked about in Deuteronomy 32. Israel proper is one. And Ephraim across the ocean, United States of America and Canada, we're the other. God is going to take both Canada, guys. D don't You Canadians don't think you're going to be you know, off the chain here, off the hook. He's going to smoke you too. For their vine is the vine of Sodom and the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of poison, gall, bitterness. Their clusters are bitter. Their wine is as the poison of dragons and the cruel venom of asps. Is not this laid up in store with me and sealed up among the treasures? To me belongeth vengeance, says God, and recompense. That almost sounds like Romans. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. This is the same God talking in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Isn't that something? Not two different gods. God the Father of Mini and God the Son. He just loves every sin and he's so tolerant of everybody's wickedness. God the Father 
hates foolish nations. But God the Son, he just loves stupid retards. He just loves them continuing in that way. He loves them just, you know, saying no to holiness and walking away from holiness and saying no to God and his goodness and his word. And, and Jesus just loves not being in everybody's thoughts. Stupid church. I'm going to encourage you guys to say, God, whatever it takes, I want to walk with you. I want to be a person of your word. I want to read your word. I want to read Genesis to Revelation before this thing's done. Help me out. I want to shut off the TV, shut off the world, shut off stupidness, all foolishness. I don't want any glimpse of a foolish nation in me. You called me a holy nation. You called me a peculiar people. You called me royal and I want to live accordingly to that, Lord God. Help me do this. He'll say, okay, shut everything out and start reading your Bible. Hear my voice as you read it. Continuing on, we'll, we'll stop right here probably. Verse 35. To me belongeth vengeance and recompense. Their foot shall slide in due time. Why? Because they didn't concern, consider their end, their latter days. They just living it up for the moment. Right now, baby. Right now. That's much of the church. They'll slide in due time for the day of their calamity is at hand. And the things that shall come upon them are going to make haste. For the Lord shall judge his people, his people, his people, his people, his people, his people. First, judgment begins in the house of the Lord. They, they who say they believe God. It's a different God. Okay, you and I who are disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ who are saved, we judge ourselves to the scriptures. We read the scriptures and go, oh, I'm out of line there. And we read some more. And go, oh, okay. Praise God, Lord. You put me in line there. And the scriptures will let you know who you are. And what we do is adjust ourselves to the scriptures. Even if it hurts, because all truth is good. Even the truth that hurts. And Lord, I'm here for the truth. I'm here for the long haul. I'm here to consider my latter days. And my latter days are going to be a rapture and a judgment seat of Christ, Lord. And I want to please you at the judgment seat of Christ. I want to have a lot to give to you. A lot of crowns to throw at your feet. Please help me with that, Lord Jesus. Consider your end days, guys. Consider your latter days, not today. God hates, hates. And he says so in Scripture. The idea of, oh, eat, drink, and be merry because tomorrow, man, we may not have it. So just have a blast tonight. God hates that. Hey, guys, I love you. Why don't you determine you're going to be back to what God purposed for us, the church, to be is a holy nation and remove yourself, every molecule of you, every thought, every breath, everything, anything visual. Do not have your eyes on anything wicked, temporary, and of the foolish nation. You look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Look to him. I love you guys. I love you dearly. I'm thankful that we hang out each night. And by God's grace, we'll do it again tomorrow. I send you along with God's blessings, the blessings of the holy nation. Walk holy, for he is holy. Be ye holy, he says, for I am holy. So we want to be as our master. And let's be faithful children. Let's be a faithful bride. Mm. That would be the greatest gift to give him is virginity when he comes. Lord Jesus, we've been faithful only to you and nobody else. You are our only God. You are our only consideration. You are our mind. You are our strength. You are everything. You are the only thing to us. What a gift to give him. I love you, man. God bless you.